Good afternoon, Regeneration Nashville. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, welcome. And uh, our online audience, it's always a joy to uh, have you join us. And uh, so I had a, a dear friend that said once that praise is the vehicle into God's presence. And worship is what we do once we arrive there. And so today we've gathered here to lift our voices, to praise the Lord, for He is our God. We exalt His name, hallelujah, for He has done wonderful things. Will you pray with me? Hallelujah. So, Father, we just praise You. We praise Your name. And it is by faith that we step into Your presence. Hallelujah. And we worship your majesty. We worship your majesty. And we declare your glory in all the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
soul And God is in control Satan's on my trail But I'm singing all is well He's attacking every day But I'm watching while I pray No matter the attack I won't turn back This means war Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day, but I'm watching while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back. Hey, this means war. the same whatever's going on i've got my war clothes on i might be in a daze but you can't have my praise no matter the attack i won't turn back hey this means war this means this means war this means war this means war watch out this means war oh this means war this means war hey.
Hallelujah, church. You know, the Bible says uh, in the seeking we find him and, and, and I'm sure y'all could feel it too, but just in the midst of our worship, in the midst of the seeking, we found the Holy Ghost and I just felt him flood into the room and there's no, there's no feeling like that when you find the Holy Ghost and you feel him enter the room and you know everything's gonna be okay, hallelujah. We're gonna continue our praise and our giving today, and, and the Bible says that, that the Lord loves a, a cheerful giver, not a, not a happy giver, but, a, but a, you know, a joyful in our giving. Happiness is a feeling, but, but joy is a choice. And so today I choose to be cheerful. I choose to be joyful in my giving despite any circumstances going on in my life. The Bible says God calls those things that are not as though they were. And so I just encourage you to speak into your situation, even if you don't feel it, you say today, I am a, cho a joyful giver. I am joyful in, in my giving and watch that come to pass in your life. We'll say our offering declaration together. Because I am a tither and a giver, the windows of heaven are open to me and God rebukes the devourer for my sake. I am blessed financially and receive a blessing that I cannot contain. I choose to sow cheerfully and bountifully knowing I will reap bountifully. He makes me the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. The blessings of God are chasing me and overtaking me because God loves to see me prosper. I am believing him for advancements, God ideas, blessings and increases, financial freedom and breakthroughs. Hallelujah. Hello, Regeneration Praise Nashville. God. Uh, you can listen, be seated. You're looking at a pastor that is so excited. We are on the end of our new building, and I'm gonna show you some video clips. We have made so much progress. My God, you stand out and look at the front of the building and you cannot help but just have your heart leap with what God has done. And uh, I know some of you uh, have wondered, you know, how long is it gonna be? But we're hoping New Year's Eve to be in that new building. And uh, some of you have asked about, can we still donate? Listen. Uh, of course, as we're at the end of this project, we still need a lot of money. And uh, if God challenges you, write a check. Uh, we'll give you a place online here to, to make that offering. But we want to encourage you. And we're getting ready to have church at 709 Rivergate Parkway. Can't wait to be in there with you. Get a chance. Watch the videos. If you're in town, drive by. And uh, we'll see you soon. For more information or to donate to Destination Miracle, go to RegenerationNashville.org. Sow out of your abundance and make a difference today. Isn't that fabulous? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I'm so excited and I'm homesick. I'm homesick. Uh, oh my goodness, did we have a wonderful picnic yesterday. Some of the best cake I ever ate right there yesterday at our picnic. Thank you. Our ladies worked so hard and they cooked. And uh, some of our men were over there flipping burgers and hot dogs. And, oh, we had the best time. And did you play softball? Yeah. Did you play softball? Who played softball? Did we win? And the cornhole. Who won the cornhole, I wonder? 
So I got one hand over here. She want, you want a cornhole? Well, all right. Praise the Lord. Well, it, I just want to tell you it was wonderful, and the Lord just blessed us with gorgeous weather, a beautiful, beautiful day, and I love fellowshipping with my church family. I think it's so wonderful how God has put so much love in this church family, and we literally enjoy being around one another. No one wanted to go home. We were just eating and fellowship and have a great time. So uh, we have some folks from out of state that I want to acknowledge today. Uh, somebody is here from Pennsylvania. Well, stand and let us welcome you. God bless you. Honored to have you. Where in Pennsylvania? Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I've been there. Spent a week there one day. Sure did. Yeah. So anybody else from out of state that we can acknowledge today? Just so glad to have our church family here. Anybody? Yes. Uh-huh. Where are you from? Marion, Illinois. God bless you, sir. Honored to have you. Thank you for being with us at Regeneration Nashville. Anybody else? Don't raise your hand back there, brother. I'll think it's you. Yeah. No. Anyway, we're just so glad to have everybody here. I'm glad to be here. I sat on the interstate 45 minutes behind a wreck. People were walking their dog up and down there. Several people got their dogs out walking their dog like we were going to spend the afternoon there. And I said, Holy Ghost, you're going to have to clear a path to Regeneration Nashville. i got to go to church. And he did it. God's so good. So the youth are going to Honeysuckle Farm, Honeysuckle Hill Farm, this Saturday, October 26th. Uh, for more inf information, see Pastor Nicholas. We have Baptism Sunday next Sunday. So uh, if you have invited Jesus in your heart but have never been baptized, we want to encourage you to be baptized next Sunday. Uh, and we also have corporate prayer Saturday, November the 2nd. So always the first Saturday of the month, our church family gets together and we pray together. But also I want to remind you that leading up to the election, we are going to be praying together for this upcoming election. And I, I just want to just, you know, I'm just going to state the obvious. The worst thing that we as a church can do is to get comfortable and feel like we know how the election is going gonna, is gonna to go and we're just going to assume, you know, that everything goes correctly. But we as a church, we need to be vigilant. We need to watch and pray. And God has sent this church a church full of prayer warriors that know how to watch, pray, and intercede. So I want to encourage you leading up to the election. Pastor Linda, is that is that's uh, in the new building for the elect? It'll be here. Okay. Saturday morning, November the 2nd, we will be here. On Monday and Tuesday night, we will be at the new building, 709 Rivergate Parkway, and we'll be praying for the election. And so we're just gonna, we're gonna send angels to war that night. Do you believe that? So amen, amen. So I, uh, as we were talking about baptism, uh, we had a magnificent, I just wanna say it's wonderful to be home from Africa. It's absolutely wonderful. But I want our Africa team uh, to come up, um, uh, Christina Oberst and Sarah Beeler, Nicholas uh, Christmas, Pastor Cheryl Elliott, and I just want them to come because we had a powerful time in Africa of, of ministry. And those people were so hungry and receptive to the Lord. And I know that you're wondering where Pastor Jasmine is. She did not lead worship. And uh, she uh, is not with our group, but she was there and preached and did a powerful job there in Africa too. But um, she came back with, I, I'm not really sure what, we were at urgent care this morning with her. And so be in prayer for Pastor Jasmine. So I wish that she was here to tell us uh, her experience. But I just want you to say something good about what happened in Africa, Pastor Cheryl. Please step up this way, right on up, all of us. Okay, go ahead, Pastor Cheryl. I'm, I'm going to need an interpreter. Will you interpret for me? 
Buana Yesu Asefiwe. The Lord bless you. <laughs> Africa was absolutely amazing. Uh, the uh, landscape will have you gasping. It's breathtakingly beautiful and it is majestic. And the people there are as gracious are they as they are humble. Um, there is a hunger for the Word of God and the presence of God that is tangible. Yeah. You can feel it and there is a deep desire for change and the needs there are very great. And as I reflect on the incredible sights that we saw and the stories that we heard, I realize that Africa has a piece of my heart that will always be there. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity for Pastor Kent and Pastor Candy and for our missions director, uh, Pastor Nicholas, for allowing us to go and for uh, Christina for orchestrating the whole trip. It was just amazing. And to my sweet, precious friends here that sent me text and letters and emails encouraged me along the way. I want you to know how much I appreciate it and how much I love you I, with all of my heart, and I'm so glad to be back among my company. God bless you. I just want to thank everybody for your prayers. Like, we really felt them over there because we couldn't do what we did over there without you because we are one body together. And um, I really didn't feel like three weeks was enough time for me, says the girl who lived overseas eight years. <laughs> but I'm not moving, I promise. <laughs> I'm staying here. <laughs> but for me, I think the highlight for me was just the hunger, like she said. And we, Christina and I got to do a staff training with the Binti staff there. And it's so important to raise up the locals. And there was about 20 of them and just to empower them with the word of God. Because the kingdom, God's kingdom, it, it transcends culture, you know, our culture. Because we're one family with them. And for them to really grasp hold the truth of the gospel so that they can get more healing in themselves, so that they can go and they can, um, there's 50 day students that come into this program that some of them have been sex trafficked or they've just had horrible situations. But now these staff, they, they're, they can be empowered more to do the work of Christ there because they're the boots on the ground. And so it's just such a, and a beautiful work. And so I just thank you again for just your love, your support and everything. I wanna say as well, just thank you so much for all your prayers and your support in so many ways. We felt it so much. And, and again, you are a part of everything we do, you know? And so, but I think for me, the beauty of this trip, there's so much I could say, but what was so beautiful to me is seeing the depth of healing that God brought in hearts and to see the deep responses from the hearts of his daughters and just to see the beauty of that and to come alongside that and minister his love was just so beautiful to me. And we saw that everywhere we went. And so, yeah. I appreciate your prayers. We couldn't have made it without your prayers. It's, it's, it's too, it's nice. Our team carried the anointing. When you're anointed, you don't bring any sickness back. So y'all pray for Pastor Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't show her that. <laughs> uh, I, I think the most poignant moment for me was uh, I think uh, uh, of the woman with the alabaster box and, and, and you know, she, um, she, I wanna say, not the alabaster box, but the woman who wept and, and she, she washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair and, and to, to, to weep out the depth of your soul. And we had an altar call and, and all of these women came up and, and then there at the end, they, they began to disperse and I, and I looked out on these concrete floors and you just see, you just see puddles and it's from their tears. And, and the whole floor was just, just wet with their tears. And the Holy Ghost was so strong there. And, and, and it just, it brought the story to life for me and, and to see the depths of their need. And, and the same Jesus that we find in this building was walking amongst them and, and ministering to them. And man, God is so faithful, hallelujah. 
there were so many tears on the floor that they literally had to mop the floor after the altar service. It was soaking wet. Then Pastor Nicholas and I had a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to baptize. And so I just tell you about that very quickly. And if you just stay here with me. Uh, so the, the Maasai people, uh, they don't have access to a river or a pond. And so the women will walk miles, like five or six miles, right? And get a bucket of water and carry it on their head back to their homes for their cooking and drinking. So, so they literally don't have access to water. The only time they as human beings get, get wet is when it rains. So that for them to be immersed in water was, was truly unusual and terrifying for them. And so Pastor Nicholas and I are in this tank of water, and they came, they came to be baptized one by one. Pastor Nicholas said, I felt like I was baptizing cats because when they went down, they came, they came out of that water. You know, they were trying to get out. But when, when we laid our hands on their chest to, to pray for them as they were about to go under, you could feel their heart just pounding because they were terrified of the water. But they overcame their, tear, their fear and their terror for their love for Jesus Christ. And it was amazing. It was truly amazing. So before we left, they, they made us honorary uh, uh, Maasai tr tribalists, right? And so they gave us a Maasai uh, robe, a, tri a tribal garment, and made us all honorary Maasai. So uh, if my son-in-law, John Michael, could come up here. So before the service was over, uh, they called me back up, and they said, we want to make Pastor Kent Christmas a tribal, a tribal Maasai. So Pastor Kent, would you please come? And while he's coming, I wanna say thank you to he and John Michael that, for doing cake talk and turning it into steak talk, right? They did awesome. Come here, Pastor Kent. This is from the Maasai pastor of the Maasai tribe there and just wrap that around his shoulders. And I need, where's our photographer? Uh, we, all right, there you are. She Look did right. not ask permission to do this. <laughs> so you know it's easier to get forgiveness than permission, right? So don't you love that, Pastor Kent? Yeah. Maasai Tribalist. Give our whole team a wonderful hand. Thank you for your help, for, for sending us, and God bless you. I thought you might just wear that while you're preaching today. I well, don't know, yeah. That isn't bad as having my feet washed, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, John. But part of the culture, and it's, and it's very, very sad, um, a lot of the men in that culture are not believers, don't go to church, and uh, the women have to do almost all of the work. The men sit under trees and, and talk, and... Um, the, it, it's just their culture. The men beat their, their wives with, with rods. And um, a lot of the women that came to the meetings uh, knew that when they got home, their husband was going to beat them with a rod because they went to church. And they went to church anyway. And here we are today sitting in the presence of God without any fear of physical abuse. And I'm very grateful. I am so grateful for the religious freedom in the United States of America. And we, we, we owe this to men and women that are in graves. We owe it to our soldiers who on foreign soul gave their life for this nation. We also owe it to the great patriarchs and men and women of God down through history who were put to death for their belief in Jesus Christ and defended the faith. And, and I'm going to talk to you about that today, but I wanted to say it was, it's just great to have... Um, Joey and 
Melody with me today, Tart. Uh, I met them many years ago when I would go preach in Dunn, North Carolina. And Joy would come pick me up and we just, there's a lot of people I don't really like. <laughs> and then there are, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and you just instantly, you just, you just like them. And that is a man that I love. And then, of course, um, great honor today to Brother Dale Hill. And uh, you don't know the man that's have sitting in this building, but every time you turn on Christian television, you have that man to thank. He is the one that uh, pretty much started CBN, TBN, 700 Club, PTL. Uh, did the first broadcast for T.D. Jakes, I think, with Kenneth Copeland. Um, so every major ministry and every major television network, uh, he was pretty much the man that they brought in to start that. And so we're honored to have you today. And I'm honored to have you. Amen. Um, I'm glad you're here today. And if you want to stand... Um, we're going to read three portions of Scripture. It really wasn't until Friday that I began to have some clarity on what God wanted to say today. And um, we're going to really pick up to some degree where we were last week. But I want you to turn with you to Matthew 25. We read out of there last week. We're going to read out of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 13, and then we will go to the book of Jude. Of course, it only has one chapter. We will read from there. But in Matthew, chapter 25, and I just want to read two verses this time. While the bridegroom tarried, that's where we are right now. Most, we are waiting for the bridegroom to come back. And while the bridegroom <clears throat> tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And uh, the word slumber here literally means negligent and careless. And unfortunately, that to a great degree describes so many believers today. They have become negligent and careless with their faith. Verse 6, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now over to the Gospel of John chapter 13. This is the story of, in fact, let's just read verse 20, start with 26. Jesus answered, said, he it is to whom I shall give the sop. The disciples have posed the question, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? He said, he it is to whom I give the sop, and when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do it quickly. And no man at the table knew to what intent he spake this unto him. Some thought, the disciples thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus said unto him, go buy some things that we need for the feast, or that he should give money to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went out immediately <clears throat> And the reason I read this verse is for this phrase, and it was night. Now let's go to the gospel or to the book of Jude. It's the last book before Revelation. Very small book. <clears throat> Familiar verse. Verse 3, beloved when I gave all diligence to write unto you 
of the common salvation. He said, it was needful for me. He was pressed in the spirit, he says. It's needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that once or one time was delivered unto the saints. Now, Holy Ghost, you put this in my spirit. Now, release it, God, to those that are watching online, to those that are in this building. God, I hear a clarion call from heaven to all of us. I pray, God, that in the next few moments that you will champion men to enlist or re-enlist into the army of God for this hour that we are in. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. You can be seated. I don't think it takes too much discernment to know this, that you and I are living in a very dark time. I think that all of us would come to the same agreement that never in our lifetime have we ever lived in an hour that is darker spiritually than it is right now. For other cultures, other times, we can think back to the Romans, we can think back to to the Greeks, different eras, that there was so much sin and debauchery, but in those, in those cultures or in that time, sin was not, they were not proud of it. Sin was hidden. It was done in the dark places. There was, there was still shame. You didn't want to be exposed. They, they did it in the dark so nobody could see it. But the hour that you and I are in right now, spiritually, is a different hour. It's darker than it's ever been because sin is not hid anymore. It's championed. No one's ashamed anymore. It is something to be proud of. We look at the hour that we are walking in, and unfortunately the enemy has tricked us into thinking that the battle is political. It is not. This is what we're getting ready to see in this election. It's not a political battle. It's not about two two candidates, a man and a woman. It is about hell trying to put a stranglehold on a nation that was birthed for the glory of the Lord. This is why writer said this. He said, it is needful for me. I need to remind you that you need to earnestly contend for the faith. Not a doctrine. Not something that says, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Pentecostal. This word faith literally means the conviction that God exists and he is the creator and ruler of all things and that the Son of God named Jesus is the Messiah and only through him can mankind attain or obtain eternal salvation. There is an all-out war against the faith that God one time delivered to the people of the Lord on this earth. Say, well, it's all right, you know, we can, we can be casual. We can approach it with a, a different attitude. We believe God will move again, but the writer's very clear. He says this, God isn't going to deliver faith again if we let hell take it. He says it's only been delivered one time. And if the church lets hell take out of the earth the very knowledge and revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not going 
going to get it back. So there is a clarion call to you and I uh, that Paul is saying, uh, if you are a believer, you need to put your army boots on. Uh, you need to put a weapon in your hand. Uh, you need to look hell in the eye uh, and say, I am earnestly contending uh, for the faith that has once been delivered unto the church. It's sad to see how the enemy has been so successful. 2 Corinthians 11 talks about this. He said that Satan himself has been transformed into an angel of light. I would say that the greatest crisis that the church is dealing with is not from without, but it's from within. Because there is a counterfeit church, especially in America. I know that I preach this, that we need God to do something supernaturally in this nation for us to bring the harvest in. But did you know that the areas where the greatest conversions are happening are nations that do not have religious freedom? Whether it's China or Russia or some of the other countries, they are experiencing tremendous amounts of men and women that are being born again without religious freedom. The issue is that's been for centuries they've had it they've been without it so they've learned how to live in that environment but america doesn't know how to have church without hallelujah having religious freedom and if we let hell walk in here uh, and stick soldiers in our buildings uh, burn our bibles uh, shut our schools down uh, get rid of our christian colleges do away with our christian music will we survive uh, i don't know uh, but i do know this uh, there shall be light in the evening time uh, if God can get some men and women uh, that will step up to the plate uh, look hell in the eye uh, and say not on my watch uh, I am earnestly uh, contending uh, for the faith <laughs> see the, the reason that I read about Judas, I, I have to think that Jesus, with his foreknowledge, knew that Judas would be the one to betray him. But that was not set in stone. There is no such thing as predestination. God knowing what you're going to do doesn't mean you're going to do it. It means he knows the choices that you're going to make. But he does not enforce those choices. There's been a great confusion on thinking that, well, we're born and we don't have any control. God gives you choice. Hallelujah. No one is destined to hell. No one is created lost. It is not God's will that any man should perish, but that all should, hallelujah, have eternal life. God, Jesus picks Judas, and he, the, the task that he gave Judas was, he said, you're going to carry the money back. I personally think that the reason that Jesus let Judas carry the money back was because he knew Judas had a problem with money. And he was trying to bring him to a place that he could conquer that weakness in his life. So he could be in the presence of Christ and he could watch the things. The other issue I believe that Judas had was he was hungry for power. Because he saw the effect that Jesus had on people. He saw that he was supernatural in controlling nature and raising the dead and that even the Jewish leaders were, they didn't know what to do with him. 
And Judas is thinking in terms of that he's going, God is going to create a natural kingdom and I'm going to be a big shot in his, in his cabinet, in his kingdom. And I really believe that what he was trying to do was force Jesus to start a natural kingdom. And Jesus said this, Judas is going to betray me. And when he gave him the sop, it was an act of great respect or friendship. And he handed that to Judas. Jesus was not betrayed by an enemy. He was betrayed by a friend. And it was nighttime when it happened. And I have a feeling that what I'm feeling in my spirit is it is nighttime in the spirit. And there's too many Judases in the house that want God for natural promotion, natural prosperity. Make me wealthy. Make me happy. Make me famous. And God is saying my kingdom is not of this world. Is there somebody, hallelujah, that will tell God I will not caved in but I will stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ I shared this with my wife I don't know how well I did but this week I read a very sobering part of the scripture in Ezekiel this is Ezekiel chapter 33 and it leaped up in my spirit because we have too many shepherds standing in pulpits that are not warning the sheep of the enemy that's coming. And, you know, I've, I've heard this a lot. Well, you know, they're just an outer court ministry. And... You know, God doesn't really expect them to preach the hard stuff. You know, and leave that to Pastor Kent. <laughs> but Paul said, I did not shun to declare unto you the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And when God calls a man or a woman, in fact, we'll just, we'll just read a few verses here in Ezekiel chapter 33. Verse 2, son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchmen. When he sees the sword come upon the land and he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, but he doesn't take the warning. If the sword comes and takes him away, he said, his blood shall be on his own head. Verse 5, because he heard the sound of the trumpet and he took not the warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword come and doesn't blow the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword comes and takes any person from among them, this is so powerful. It says, he shall be taken away in his own iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. It's very interesting when you read this because the Lord is saying that if the watchman, the preacher, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist sees and knows by the Spirit that there is the enemy coming, but he doesn't want to warn them. I don't want my church to get smaller. I don't want the offerings to decrease. I want everybody to like me. 
I don't want anybody to feel bad about themselves. So I'm just not going to say anything. That is the condition in so many of our churches in the United States of America that the world is going to hell on grease skids because we don't have enough watchmen that have the intestinal fortitude to stand in the pulpit and say the word of God is true and you cannot rewrite it. You cannot take parts out. You cannot exclude it. But you got to preach the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm preaching to you like this today. But the Lord says this to all of the seeker friendly preachers that stand in pulpits and you won't preach truth. He said, those people may, he said, they will die in their iniquity. But, and this, this opens up a real interesting realm of discussion theologically. He said, but their blood, I won't require of them. He said, I'm going to require it of the leaders that didn't sound the warning. It sounds like almost that if somebody's never been warned, never been told that they'll die in their iniquity. And see, this is the question we ask. What about the millions of people in Africa and China that never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and they die? Do they go to hell? Number one, I have to say God is a merciful God and he is a just God. And he says, I take no joy or pleasure in the death of the wicked. It could be that the Lord, hallelujah, by his foreknowledge knew that if they had been given the warning they would have turned from their wicked ways. So maybe, hallelujah, there's a realm for them that God says, I'm not going to put you in hell. But he did say this to the men and women that won't sound the trumpet, won't tell the truth. He says, if the lost die in their iniquity, he said, when you stand before me on judgment day with your 10,000 people and your $100 million building, he said, the souls of the men that you would not preach the gospel to he said I will require their blood on you so we're in a we're in a very liquid situation in America I've, I've never felt so much pressure in the spirit over this election as I'm feeling because there is more to this and this has nothing to do with Republicans and Democrats. There is a war going on in the spirit realm right now between good and evil. This is not about political ideologies. 80, Fox News says that 85% approximately of the black community is Democrat. I don't think that there is another culture that has the potential to impact the kingdom of God any more than the black community. Some of the greatest minds go back through history, whether it's Carver or Martin Luther King, or, and the list goes on and on of these men who have made such contributions. Some of the greatest singers that have ever lived came out of the African-American community. Hard worker, the slaves that lived and were in slavery were family people, godly people that held true to the word of the Lord it was perpetrated upon them. But somewhere that community had leaders that would not speak the true gospel of Jesus Christ and they led their culture down a different path. But oh, thank God that there are some men in this hour. I praise God. Listen, there's a man that pastors in, in um, I think it's Tampa, Dr. Keenan Bridges, a black pastor, found him during the coronavirus. He's going to come preach for us at our conference in the spring. A mighty man of God. 
I talked with him on the phone recently, and he told me, he said, there's so much pressure on me, even from his own culture, because of the message that he preaches. You need to call his name out in prayer, because he's a man, hallelujah, that sees the sword coming, and is speaking to his own people uh, that there has to be a change. There's another great pastor, I've never met him, but he's out of Atlanta, Georgia. His name is Philip Anthony Mitchell. You need to pull him up on the internet. Here's another black pastor that is not intimidated to stand up and declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I thank God that in the midst of a dark night, we still got some men and women that are declaring. What are they doing? They are earnestly contending for the faith that has once been delivered unto the saints. You say, Pastor, why do you make us go without eating for three days and come to church and pray when it's hard because if we don't earnestly contend for the faith we're going to lose everything that we got and we will be a tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass having the form of godliness but no power thereof I hear God saying are there men and women under the sound of my voice we will tell God I am available I will stand in the gap I will hold on to the word of the Lord This is why God lets us know he does his best work in the dark. Doesn't matter how dark it is. This book cannot be altered by an election. I'll be off publicly about this. I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. But... Let me clarify why. I know lots of people that are going to vote for him. They'll say this, I don't like him. I think he's arrogant. That's their, their take. That's not why I'm voting for him. You have two choices. You vote for who stands closest to the principles of the word of God. You hear me? You vote for a candidate that stands for abortion and full-term abortion. The next time a doctor puts the scallops in the womb of a young girl and pours, tears out a fetus. And you think, well, the blood's on that doctor's hands. Listen, if you pull the lever for the wrong one, the blood of the doctor, the blood of that baby is on your hand. You don't get to say, well, I don't want to get involved. You don't get to say, well, it's a different day. God is holding the church responsible. You need to stand there, pull a lever that says, I I believe in pro-life. I believe in babies or real people. See, we don't get this kind of preaching anymore. If this offends you, there's the door. And hallelujah, because we are standing up for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need mealy mouth, lukewarm men and women that can't stand for the gospel. But oh, hallelujah, we'll stand up and believe in the gospel of Jesus. Why did Paul say contend? Because only the church can stop the next full-term baby who's laid on a stainless steel table and the doctors go over and kill it. Because the mother has too many things. She don't want to be inconvenienced with a baby. See, we don't like to pull the ugly off. We want to paint it, and, well, we'll make it comfortable, and we'll give it a drug, and it's, it's out-and-out murder. And this is, this is why 
we have to get serious because our enemy is definitely not the young girl. Our enemy is not the doctor performing the abortions. I want to say up front, God died for them through Jesus Christ. And there is a love of God that is reaching. Hallelujah. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to see God take a doctor that's done 10,000 abortions, fill him with the Holy Ghost, and him stand on a platform and say, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And say, as Paul, I was a blasphemer, but I did it in ignorance. And the Lord has washed it away by the blood of the Lamb. I see a fountain, a crimson stream of blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins that's going to engulf our enemies and change their lives. But speaking truth does not mean that you have hate in your mouth. And so on this this area, this election we're going into. You pull a lever for a change of the DNA and sexually altering three-year-old babies. The moment you pull that lever because you feel like that candidate will make your life more prosperous, you got to pay the price. Hallelujah, you got to pay the price. I would rather die in poverty with righteousness in my spirit. Hallelujah. Listen, you could bring back every major movie star from Elvis to Clark Gable to Burt Lancaster to Ursula Andress, the list goes on and on, that are dead. And if you could bring them back today, they would try one thing, give your heart to Jesus and live for him because fame is temporary. Homes are temporary. Doesn't matter if you live for 80 years, wealthy and indulged, in a moment's time, it's gone. And then you're going to cross over to the other side and the only currency you're going to have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's in your soul and in your spirit. We need, may God raise up voices again. May God raise up voices. Hallelujah. May God, oh God, raise up voices in this nation that are uncompromising but are balanced, full of love and mercy, but still preach, hallelujah, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You mark it down, the day's going to come. You won't have room in a building, hallelujah, for the harvest that's coming in. I see it at 709 Rivergate Parkway. We're going to be full and overflowing. Why? Because there are men and women that are hungry for the Lord and for his presence. And so we have this, unfortunately, we have this entity within the church that calls themselves believers that uphold the tenets and the precepts of an evil concept. Somebody has to create an atmosphere that the LBD, LBGTQ can come into the presence of the Lord and be changed. Because you know what? Us going on some hate rampage and say, you don't, you don't believe in that. I will believe that homosexuality is normal when one man can get another man pregnant. And until that, it ain't normal. Because everything that God makes, he makes it to reproduce. Hallelujah. And he made a man and a woman to reproduce and to repopulate the earth. And there is this demonic, if you could see 
the demon spirit that's in the atmosphere. If God would open your eyes, it would be so hideous, we would probably vomit because we're seeing him. But we have become so drunk on numbers. Hallelujah. And the world to like us. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, listen, God's up to something. You can, you, I, I watched this last week. They're interviewing Alice Cooper. And he is talking about Jesus. He's talking about serving the Lord. He said, you know why? They don't want to serve Jesus and accept him as their Savior because then they got to do what he says. And they all want to do their own thing. He said they go Buddhist, they go Muslim, but they're still searching. That's Alice Cooper. Hallelujah, you got Kelsey Grammer standing up talking about Jesus Christ and the only way to salvation. I, I'm seeing God begin to do something in the Holy Ghost. And the Lord has been kind of holding back because he's waiting for you to see which side you get on. Get off of the fence. Get off of the fence. Get on. The Lord said this, if you are not for me, you are against me. Neutrality is a vote for the enemy. Hallelujah. You got to be willing. You got to be willing at all costs. Revelation 3 1 says to the church in Sardis, be watchful and strengthen those things that remain. That are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. The beauty of it is. Is that he is still reaching to Sardis. He didn't say. I'm done with y'all. You're all going to hell. He said listen. I'm talking to you. He said. You need to start watching. And he said. You need to strengthen the things that remain. Because he says they're, getting, they're on life support system. The altar in the American church is on, alt, it's on life support system. Altar calls are on life support system. Hallelujah. I had so many people tell me, Pastor, before I came to your church, I never fasted a day in my life. And they're saying, you know what? I have people say, you know what? It was really hard, but I'm learning how to do it. Or they'll say, we never prayed a whole hour before. And, you know, I see some of you come to prayer meeting and, and you just sit quietly in the chair. You know what I say? Thank God you came. You're learning. Hallelujah. You made the effort. And your pastors applaud you for that. I don't have to have you shabaking out loud and running around the building. <clears throat> I just need to know, hallelujah, that you believe in the power of prayer. That's what we're doing. You know what we're doing right now in this afternoon service? We are earnestly contending for the faith that has once been delivered unto the saints. Why? Because the devil goeth about as a roaring lion. He's trying to snuff out everything that he can. I can tell you this, every Every major ministry in America can be uncovered and unclean and fall. But I can still tell you this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. For the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. It doesn't matter. The church is not built on a man. It's not built on a television program. It is built on the rock of ages. On this rock will I build my church church and the very gates of hell shall not shall not shall not prevail against it the only reason regeneration naturally exists is because God put a call out for men and women who were hungry for the presence of the Lord it's it's just amazing how so much of the modern church has no discernment. It just, it stuff goes right over their head. There's a verse, it's in Jude, it's the fourth verse. He said, 
there are men who have crept in unaware. And he said, this is what they're doing. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And this is what the word lasciviousness means. Unbridled lust. And another word it has, when I Google it, is outrageous. We, we have men in America that are standing in pulpits that have taken grace and turned it into a message of unbridled lust. Whatever you want to do, it's all right. Grace will get you through. Well, as your pastor today, I'm standing on this platform telling you, you cannot live in sin. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, years ago, we could go to the movies. PG movie didn't have any cussing in it. You really can't go to the movies anymore. You're going to hear GD. You're going to hear Jesus Christ, you're going to hear the F word. And listen, if we are contending for the faith, you can't say, well, I'll just filter that out because it's got a good story. You need to walk out. You need to earnestly contend for the faith that has once been delivered unto the saints. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Taste not, touch not, handle not. God give us some men that are more hungry for the glory than they are entertainment the remnant is fixing to have its best days that's why there's such an attack we, we, we've used the word with some of the things that are being accepted in our society we've said the word outrageous it's outrageous it literally boggles the mind to see what we're calling and what we're at, what they're telling us. When, when Paul is, when Jude is writing and he says, you have to contend. You, you're going to have to, the, the word uh, contend literally means a military campaign. We have to think in terms of we are in war. We are in a war for not only the nation that we are in, but for the souls of our children and our grandchildren. Hallelujah. You may say, well, you know, I've learned how to survive. I love the Lord. But what about your grandkids that have never, ever been in the presence of the Lord? that are being raised on the bosom of iPhones and iPads that Disney is putting out with all of their hidden things hidden in those things. We, oh God, touch our children program up there. Touch our youth pastor, our children's pastor. May the Holy Ghost fall out upon our kids that our young kids will sing and prophesy. And he said this, he said, they crept in unawares. Now, the word crept in literally means stealthily. They, they stepped, they, they hid them. The Lord says, he said, you know, it's like sheeps or wolves clothed in sheep clothing. This is why you need to have a prayer life. Because not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes you can hear something, you can meet somebody, and the Spirit of God in you, the, the bell will go off. And say, there's something here that, that I don't understand. Um, you say, are we going to make it, Pastor? Absolutely. We're going to see... I want to just read a a verse out of Ezekiel chapter 44. And the Lord is speaking to 
Ezekiel. And verse 15 of chapter 44, he said, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. They shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary. They shall come near to my table to minister unto me. They shall keep my charge. And he's, he's talking to Ezekiel, and he said this. When you read this setting, he said that there was a season where Israel went astray from the Lord. And he said, when they did, a huge contingency of the Levites went with them, followed them into their sin. But he said, there were some sons of Zadok that when the Levites began to leave the presence of God and Israel began to go into idolatry, he said, the sons of Zadok, they retreated into my sanctuary. And he said, they stood guard. He said, it wasn't a wonderful time. There wasn't a lot of sacrifice going on. The smoke wasn't filling the temple. But he said, these priests made a pact that we will guard this temple, hallelujah, until the presence of the Lord comes back. And the day came when the Lord said, the Levites that went astray, he said, they have to stay in the outer court. They can fillet their sacrifices. But he said, the sons of Zadok, because they guarded, hallelujah, they guarded. You know what we're doing on these Sunday services when we don't see the miraculous and we don't see great miracles that are creative and we're not seeing smoke in the house and we're not hearing audible voices and angels are not dancing on the platform. But while we praise God, you know what we're doing? We are guarding, hallelujah, we are guarding the sanctuary because you and I believe that there's another visitation of the presence of God that's on its way and that when God shows up, we don't want our sanctuary overrun by hell and demons and the Lord say, oh, it can't go in there. But, oh, God, would you come back? Will you find a place at Regeneration Nashville where the Zadok Company have stood and said, we have been preparing a place for the presence of God. And that when God shows up, he says, now watch me do what I do. This is why I think that we're in a place, and I wish I could preach this on a major network all over America. Hallelujah. <laughs> because we have the awesome privilege of contending. We don't need millions we just need a Gideon army hallelujah in fact the Lord said your prayers can be so powerful that just two or three of you if any two agree on any one thing that this is, this is I feel this in the spirit the Lord is saying we need to be a church for these next three weeks, we need to be earnestly contending. I, I loved how my wife said it. We just can't assume. Hallelujah. We just can't lay back and eat at J. Alexander's and the great restaurants and say, well, it'll be all right. I talked to somebody recently. I really like him. He's a good man. He said, you know, I just don't get in politics. I'm sure it'll all work out. And I thought, man, you are an ostrich with your head in the sand. Because it isn't going to work out all right. 
unless we stand up, hallelujah, plant our feet on the rock called Jesus, look the devil in the eye and say, don't cross this bloodline because we ain't backing up. We are not giving up, hallelujah. We refuse to give our nation away. We refuse to give our grandchildren away, our children away, our unsaved prodigals. But we are demanding that the enemy give back what he stole. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal your land. God put a spirit of Zadok in this house today. Hallelujah. May God wake you up at 3 in the morning. This is no time for Sunday to be on the lake. This is no time to be on a hunting stand next month. Get yourself in the house of God and declare, if God be for us, nobody can be against us. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. This verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, we've said it so many times. The weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons. I believe this is the biggest mistake that the church has made is we thought we could give a watered-down message on a national network and change the world. It doesn't matter how many people hear you preach or hear praise singers. If there's no anointing, you're just noise. You're like Seinfeld. You make everybody laugh. Leave feeling good, but nothing changes. Hallelujah. If God, and I believe the Lord, is going to give us a national platform to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we have to preach, hallelujah, the pure word of the Lord. Psalms 91 says this, he shall give his angels charge over you, and they shall keep you in all your ways. That's a promise from the Lord. He said, my angels are going to guard you. But God said, you have to guard my kingdom. This is why Paul said, he was writing to Timothy at the end of his life. He said, I have fought a good fight. If God tarries, that's just what I want my tombstone. I have fought a good fight. And he said, I have finished my course. And then he answered with this. He said, I protected. He uses the word I kept, but you look it up, it means guard. He said, I guarded the faith. See, you, you can't fight a good fight. And you can't finish your course if you haven't guarded the faith. And God is saying this to us. We have to come up higher. If America is going to be changed, we can't do it coming to church one time a week. Somewhere, hallelujah, there is, there is a clarion call from the Spirit of the Lord that's saying, come up higher. Hallelujah, and, and I can't wait to get our new building. No telling what the Lord's going to do <clears throat> in that building. But you know what? If the presence of God, see, God doesn't really respect buildings. You say, well, pastor, you know, you got Bible for that? I do. The disciples told the Lord, I said, look at this temple. It's worth billions. The Lord said, you know what? He said, one day, I'm going to let him tear it down stone by stone. Titus apologized for his soldiers dismantling that temple and taking the gold out. He said, my hands are clean. I could not stop them. You know why they did it? Because Jesus said it. 
Not one stone will be left upon another. See, it wasn't the temple that made Jesus show up. It was the praise and the purity of the people. And we can just have another beautiful sanctuary or else we can become a people that is the sanctuary in the sanctuary. Hallelujah, where the presence of God abides. So I want you to stand today because, you know, I I wasn't sure. My greatest concern always is I don't want to wound anybody. I know I'm, I'm a strong preacher, and um, I, don't want to, I, I want you to hear my heart today. But I know this. God is saying he needs some men and women that will start contending for the faith. That when you go to prayer, the Democratic nominee is not who you're praying against. But you are praying against the principalities and powers. This is why the writer said in Corinthians, our weapons are not natural weapons. And we have been fighting with natural weapons. And you cannot out-weapon the enemy. The world's got more money than us, more technology, more media, everything. But God said, Hallelujah, your weapons. You say, what are they? Righteousness, prayer, prayer, hallelujah. God, I release on this building today. Hallelujah. I don't want you to feel condemned. I want you to feel convicted. Hallelujah. May you feel challenged by the Spirit of the Lord. The Arababobo Sunday, hallelujah. God, we present Regeneration Nashville to you today. Hallelujah. (laughs) God, that we would be Zadok priests. That, Lord, you will look at us and say, they protected it. They protected my presence. They protected my house. They protected my sanctuary in the spirit. So, Lord, today, hallelujah, we make a declaration to you that, God, we're coming after the demonic strongholds that are in the spirit realm. God, we pray for every man and woman. God, I pray for Kamala Harris. I pray for Donald Trump. God, I pray for every Democrat and every Republican that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray, hallelujah, that there would be a wave of enlightenment begin to come in the spirit of the Lord. Prayer partners, come on. Hallelujah. If you want a prayer partner, you need a prayer partner to agree with you. Come quickly before we come as a church. Hallelujah. Come grab a prayer partner if you need somebody to stand with you in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many in this building can say, Pastor, I need to come up higher. Hallelujah. I need God to be more intense. I need to be more committed. Hallelujah. Listen, that's a a huge step right there. Would you come stand with me today in this front? And would you begin to tell the Lord, God, I am enlisting in the army. Hallelujah. Come on. Tell God, God, you can trust me to contend. God, you can trust me to contend for the faith. For the faith that has once been delivered unto the saints. Dear Lord, we ask for great victory in the weeks to come over this nation in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now go ahead, let your voice loose. Let your prayer language loose. Oh, God, we pray in the name of the Lord. God, we declare your word today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift up your voice. Listen, we there's enough here today to change the tide. Turn the tide. Pull down the strongholds of hell. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. 
Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ask God to lay on on you. God put a spirit of Zadok on me. Help me, Lord, to stand in the gap. I'm surrounded by you, Lord. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. to break a, one of my cardinal rules here, but I'm going to read off my phone real quick, okay? Today, watching with us online is Florida, Pennsylvania, Germany, Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, South Carolina, Texas, Maryland, Virginia, New Zealand, Iowa, England, Las Vegas, Georgia, New Mexico, Illinois, Missouri, North Dakota, Ontario, Canada, Colorado, Wisconsin, Connecticut, Ohio, Mississippi, West Virginia, Trinidad, Tobago, Kentucky, South Africa, New York, Oklahoma, Sweden, Seattle, and Alberta, Canada. Now, this is why I'm telling you this. The Bible says that if one can send a thousand to flight, and two can send 10,000 to flight. And we are joined together in this room by our faith. And we are joined together online by the body of Christ. I just want to remind you what the Word of God says, that greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. And I just want to remind you of what the prophet Elisha said. He said, Lord, open my servant's eyes that he can see that there may be more for us than be against us. And I'm going to tell you that we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. The battle's already won. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Now, this is what I just want to ask you, Holette. I just want to ask you just for a moment before we close. Would you just pray in the Holy Ghost? Would you just pray in the Holy Ghost? Hido la 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 bakai, kido la 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 bakara mahai. Remenendez de, come on, come on, church. We're just gonna do a little battle right now. Hira babo soto rama mama mama, rebebe soko mama. Hirebe kebere soka. Hey, 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 koto ra, come on, church. Iko rabo soto raba kapa. Hey, iko rabo kopa raba soto raba ka.
to give the Lord the greatest praise of the day. A shout of victory. Come on. Hallelujah. for a great word today. God bless you, Pastor Kent. We honor you, sir. We honor you, sir. God bless you. I pray that you have the greatest week that you've ever had, that blessings overtake you this week with signs and wonders and miracles and promotions and money coming in and prodigals coming home. Hallelujah. Good news. Good news on the Internet. Good news from phone calls that are coming in. I pray the greatest blessing this week that you've ever known in Jesus' name. God bless you. I'll see you right here next Sunday.